And we now move on to questions to the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. And we will start with listed questions. Questions number 5 and 11 have been withdrawn. I call Mr McQuillan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question 1. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I would like to request an extra minute to answer questions 4 and 6, which I propose to group. The establishment of the panel of parties and its deliberations under the chairmanship of uh, Richard Haas was an essential step in the search for consensus on the issues of parades, flags and dealing with the past. When we made the initial announcement about the panel of parties, we recognised that there were no easy answers. But we were and remain committed to finding long-term and sustainable solutions that are in the best interest of the community we serve. We were privileged that figures of such international standing as Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan agreed to facilitate the talks and that they offered their services on a pro bono basis. While the talks concluded without agreement between the five executive parties, this does not negate the value of the process so far nor call into question the necessary and unavoidable costs that this entailed. I call Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Does the Deputy First Minister think the revelation of the OTR letters has harmed the process? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, in the course of the last couple of weeks it has been the subject of much discussion, but I don't think it necessarily has harmed the process. I think that the challenges that all of the parties faced in relation to how we deal with the past, how we deal with the issue of parades and the whole issue of identity clearly showed, I think, in those discussions that there was a very large measure of agreement around the type of architecture and mechanisms that would be required to uh, move us forward. And I think that still represents the big challenge for all of us. Uh, we are very conscious that we have uh, a, a now beginning shortly a judicial review of the situation around uh, OTRs, uh, which people should remind themselves was part of a, a solemn agreement between both the British and the Irish governments at Western Park. But I think that the big challenge for us, and certainly what I would like to see, is a scenario where whatever is happening in terms of whatever reviews are taking place over the OTRs, it doesn't interrupt the essential work that party leaders have to engage in if we are to bring the Haas proposals to a successful conclusion. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister. I note the Deputy First Minister now talks of uh, parades, the past, and identity, rather than parades, the past, and flags and emblems. Uh, on that basis, I'm sure you heard recently on CNN Network, Professor O'Sullivan talked about, in a critical manner, uh, of, quote, the immaturity uh, uh, the immature may, way in which some engaged on the issue of identity and how that interacted with the question of sovereignty. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister, does he accept that criticism? Well, I think that the contribution made by the member to the whole Haas process and all that fell out from that in the course of the last uh, couple of uh, weeks has been something to marvel at. And I have marveled at it, how someone, how someone could, in the latter stages of the Haas discussions, uh, describe us as being 80 to 90 per cent there. And then the First Minister and I go to the United States to learn when we arrive in the United States that the member, as the leader of his party, has effectively produced all sorts of other proposals, none of which contain anything of the 80 or 90 per cent that he had articulated in the final hours of the Haas process. And I said to some of my friends in the course of the last uh, couple of weeks, I wonder what the Mike Nesbitt, who interviewed me many, many years ago on behalf of UTV, how you would conduct an interview with the Mike Nesbitt of today. And I have to say, he has turned out to be a major disappointment in this entire process and someone who has not contributed in any serious way to finding solutions to very serious problems. I call Bronwyn McGahan. 
Premier Yogit, uh, can I ask the Minister to give us assessment of the current situation with regard to the party leaders meeting uh, to discuss the proposals presented by Dr Haas and Professor O'Sullivan? Well, I, I, I'm very pleased that the party leaders are, are going to meet uh, later today. Uh, I don't know if the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party will be at those discussions. Uh, I think it would be very foolish of him not to be, but that's his prerogative. Uh, he's quite entitled not to attend. But I do think that he's swimming against the tide. I think the reality is that the vast majority of the members in this House do you believe that we need a resolution to the issue of parades? We need a resolution to the issue of the past, and we need a, a resolution to the whole issue of flags, symbols, emblems, and identity. And that, that represents a real challenge to all of us in terms of leadership, and whether or not we believe we have within us the ability to crack these very difficult situations in a way that delivers for our people. Yesterday, an event took place here in the north where hundreds of young people, uh, most of them members of the Christian churches, right across the board, engaged in what I think was a very useful exercise, which they described as has hope, and which they have all, uh, over the course of the social media in the last uh, number of hours, encouraged political leaders in this House to sit down with each other, find solutions which will give them a future. I am absolutely determined to do that. Moving on, I call Gordon Dunn. Question two, please, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jennifer McCann to answer this question. On the 10th of February, we announced that £33 million will be invested in 23 projects aimed at tackling poverty and deprivation through improved community-based services and facilities. These first 23 projects have been identified as priorities by the steering groups in each local area covered by the nine social investment fund zones. Draft letters of offer have issued to the successful projects, and these offers will be finalised following completion of verification and governance checks and agreement by lead partners on the conditions of offer. Lead partners will then take forward the procurement to deliver the outcomes described in the project's proposals that have been approved. We are keen to ensure the projects are fully established and underway as soon as possible, and officials will be providing support to the lead partners to ensure this is the case. To this end, a conference for all lead partners was held on the 10th of March, and this event has provided a great platform to move forward with the delivery. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I also thank the Junior Minister for her answers. I'm sure the Junior Minister would join with me that, that the Social Investment Fund has been somewhat slow in rollout, but and does she recognise the need for uh, further movement and progress to see rollout in places like North Down? Uh, I, mean, uh, I can give the, the, the member an update on the North Down constituency or uh, zone um, in a written reply if he wants. Certainly, I mean, this has been a process that, that, that there, you know, ha, has been slow in a sense, but certainly. Um, we were trying to, because it was always going to be a process led by the, 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 the people within the community who actually came together within the steering groups and actually devised the, the projects and the priorities for their area. And as I said, we are very, very keen, and that's why we had the meeting on the 10th of March with the lead partners. We're very, very keen to get those letters of offer verified and so the, the delivery plans can go ahead and the money can be put into the projects um, in those communities. I call Alex Maskey. Could I ask the uh, junior minister, uh, could, the, could she confirm that, uh, that as, as the information that we have all received and that, that demand has outstripped the resources available from within the SIF funds, that, uh, could the minister confirm that all of the uh, projects have been prioritised by the steering groups in each of the zones? Well, obviously, um, I'd say to the member, um, if we had had the money that, that we could have and provided the money that was needed for, for all the projects um, that came in, we would have. But unfortunately, we were working with a, a particular budget. And I think that what happened then was that the, the, the allocations, once the allocations were determined and sent out to the individual zones, 
then it was up to the Solons then to, to reprior or to revisit their their plans uh, and look at their, their priorities and that. But certainly there'll be other funding becoming available. And I mean I have to say, and I've said it in, the, in this, this house before, the a social investment fund isn't going to cure everything. You know, there's still going to be um, issues out there and services and, and projects that we need to deliver. So we would hope that you know that there would be other um, uh, other programmes there that, that would, would fit in with some of the, the priorities that the, the Solons have already identified. C could I urge members and minister to address the chair in order that their, their voice can be picked up by the microphone more mm -hmm. clearly? I call to Lois Kelly. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, in all sincerity, d does the junior minister really believe that coming into the third year of delivery and not a penny spent on project and programme delivery, that the Social Investment Fund is actually meeting what it says it would set out to achieve, and that was tackling deprivation and poverty. And could the minister tell us how many people will be lifted out of poverty as a consequence of the £80 million spent? Well, I mean, as I just said in, in my last answer um, to the previous question, the Social Investment Fund is, is, is part of the jigsaw, if you like, um, to, to tackle in poverty and disadvantage. It certainly won't lift everybody out of poverty, as the member suggested. I think it's, it's unrealistic to, to um, suggest that even. But I think that there has been a lot of movement um, in, in the recent months to, to get this push forward. There were some problems, but once the allocations were um, identified and, and the, 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 sorry, the, the letters of offer went out. There has been quite a bit of work has been done by department officials and by the steering groups um, on the ground for, for to get that, those projects moved forward. I call Leslie Cree. Question three, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, uh, again, I will ask Junior Minister McKeon to answer this question. It is important that we first confirm our commitment to implementing in full the Commissioner's advice on all 55 recommendations presented to us following the independent assessment. Throughout the assessment process, there was an extensive engagement with a number of key stakeholders to ensure their experience informed the final reports. We are pleased that the recommendations have been based on input received from these key stakeholders. Our intention is not to create undue delay by repeating or duplicating engagement, which has already taken place, but rather on focusing on taking forward the work required to ensure that further improvements are made and recommendations implemented in full. That said, we recognise the valuable input both groups and individual victims and survivors make, and as such we will ensure that engagement with key stakeholders continues during the implementation process. The majority of the report's recommendations relate to actions which fall within the responsibility of the Victims and Survivors Service, with a smaller number to be taken forward by the Commission for Victims and Survivors and OFM-DFM. Implementation will be overseen by the Programme Board, established following initial concerns raised by individual victims um, groups and the Commission for Victims and Survivors. The Programme Board comprises representatives from the Victims and, Sur and Survivors Service, the Commission, OFM, DFM and the Victims Forum. The Programme Board has agreed an overarching implementation plan which will inform individual work plans within all three organisations. Progress will be closely monitored and action taken to address any issues or risks to delivery. We remain committed to ensure the necessary action is taken in a timely manner and, most importantly, that it is the right action to address the issues identified through the independent assessment and the Commissioner's advice. Sorry, um, uh, Deputy Chair, can I just say, um, can I take uh, uh, questions three and nine together? I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Thank you. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the junior minister. The Minister will have no doubt noted that the primary criticism of the independent assessment, the lack of a fully constituted board, left the VSSS without strategic leadership and oversight until December 2013. Has the, uh, this was a serious failure, obviously. Has any apology been offered to the victims and survivors for that failure? Well, the member um, quite rightly identified uh, a problem that, that was uh, uh, brought to, to our attention. Um, there has been the chair, um, a permanent chair on board, were appointed to the Victims and Survivors Service, which took effect from, from last December. 
and uh, this will be a term for four years. And the board will strategically empower the Victims and Survivors Service to move forward with improvements and development matters. I think there were other, there were other issues there um, uh, concerning the governance. Um, there was quite a lot of um, concerns brought to us in terms of the individual reviews, assessments. So I think that, that, that to be honest, I mean, until this particular review um, was completed, and there were many recommendations, as I said, um, that, that have came forward, and we will ensure that all those recommendations um, will be quickly um, put in place. I call Ian Milne. Good afternoon, Collier. I was my weakest on Ira Gojisha. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask the Minister, is she satisfied that the necessary capabilities and expertise and indeed, uh, and indeed the will exists within the Victims and Survivors Service to ensure that all recommendations and advice are implemented? Well, I mean, as I said in my previous answer, you know, I think that, that we have now got uh, the, the copy of the recommendations that the, this review has brought forward. Um, we also have a program board which has been set up and it's um, part of that program board is officials from uh, OFM, DFM, people from the, um, the, survey, the, the service, uh, but also um, there's representatives of the commission as well, the Victims Commission and that. But there's also actually representatives from some uh, working group within the Victims Forum who are victims themselves. Um, and Mr. Alex Bunting is the representative that has been um, uh, proposed to be put on that. And I think that, that when we get all those groups together, that certainly um, we will be in a much better position now to make sure that the service um, does actually provide for the needs and the concerns of the people who really matter out there, and that's the victims and the survivors. I call Colm Eastwood. Deputy Speaker, I'm glad to hear the Minister say that uh, the Department will be implementing the recommendations in a timely manner. Can she just tell us how timely, you know, is there a timeline for, for delivery uh, in, in, in terms of the, the recommendations? Yes, well, I can tell the member that there was at the, the, the initial programme board meeting that I've just um, outlined, the, the board which has all the sectors interests um, represented at that, that that board has now um, put forward a subgroup and that subgroup has been specifically tasked with looking at the, the, the number of recommendations and there have been interim, um, uh, some interim, interim services that, that are issues that have been looked at and have been identified and particularly in terms of the form for the uh, independent yeah, needs review and I think that, that really what we're, what we're going to be doing is looking at what we can implement quickly and to look where we can't um, sort of implement the recommendations as quickly as, as we would hope that there would be some sort of um, interim peer, uh, service put in, in place there for, for to cover those issues that we, we need to give maybe a, a longer term view of. Moving on, I call Cahill Boylan. Cahill Cahar, let the hall question number four, please. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, with your permission, I will answer questions four and six together. The First Minister and I covered a wide geographical area on both the west and east coast of the United States during our official visit earlier this month. Uh, we were very pleased with the quality of the meetings we attended and with the existing and potential investment opportunities that we were able to support on the west coast. Our time in Washington, D.C. was dominated by a heavy political itinerary related to the St. Patrick's Day celebrations in Capitol Hill and the White House. In Los Angeles, we met with six senior executives from HBO. We were very struck by the warm reception we received and the enthusiasm that the company has for our relationship. It's worth noting that the Game of Thrones has brought over £98 million pounds into the local economy since HBO first came here. The spin-off in terms of increasing tourism and encouraging other production studios to come here in the back of this is obviously uh, very important to our economy. That evening we attended an event to support Cinemagic, the locally based charity which gives children from disadvantaged areas the opportunity to make films that address social issues whilst allowing them to break down sectarian and racial barriers. And we were very pleased that the event attracted over 200 guests from the film and TV production sector. We used the event to promote the local creative industry sector. And we also met Seagate Senior Management Board in San Jose. Uh, we had never been to Seagate's headquarters, headquarters before, and we wanted to underscore our personal commitment to the company. 
Since 1983, the company has invested over £1 billion pounds in the North West and employs around 1,400 people. Again, very struck by the senior management's enthusiasm for our relationship, and they were very appreciative that we took the time to visit. We hosted an inward investment launch in Silicon Valley for 120 executives, where we made keynote speeches about the local business opportunity and why we have been so successful in attracting foreign direct investment. That message was underscored by the president of Concentrix, who gave his personal testimony of his experience of our economic and workforce strength. That event was attended by several potential investors whom we were able to meet privately to encourage them to make that final commitment. In San Francisco, we officiated at the opening of Invest NI's new offices, uh, where we were joined by uh, the Mayor of San Francisco, Mayor, mayor Lee. On the investment front, we are very confident that a number of significant new investments will be announced in the coming months, uh, to which we were able to add our support and commitment at a crucial stage of the negotiations. In Washington, D.C., we were guests of the American Ireland Fund, along with the Vice President and the Taoiseach at a scholar gala dinner on the Thursday the 13th of March, and we attended the speaker's lunch with the President, the Vice President, and Taoiseach on Friday the 14th. That latter event attracts many members of Congress, and we as always are impressed with the welcome we receive from both sides of the aisle. We also hosted the Bureau's annual Sympathic State Business Breakfast for over 300 Washington-based contacts, and this annual event in the Sympathic State calendar is one that we have ownership of and continues to provide an excellent vehicle for us to engage directly with a wide range of employers. Can I ask Carl Goylen for a supplementary? Three minutes has been exceeded. Thank you. No, I'm going to ask Carl Goylen to thank the Minister for his answer, but could I ask him to give us his assessment of the importance of Seagate, particularly in the North West? Well, as I said in my earlier answer, Seagate is a hugely important U.S. company. It uh, was established at Springtown in 1983, and along with the group's Normandale site in Minnesota, manufactures the reed uh, right heads for the Seagate's group's final hard disk drive products. The company here is a subsidiary of Seagate Technology, which is the world's leading manufacturer of disk drives, magnetic disks, and reed right heads. Seagate's one of the largest employers in the Northwest, currently employs over 1,300 people and is recognized as a most advanced nanotechnology scale manufacturing facility. The Springtown factory is an integral part of Seagate's global supply chain and continues to supply over a million read-write heads every day for Seagate disk drives. Indeed, it's estimated that 25% of the world's recording heads are produced from the Springtown plant. So Seagate's importance as a major investor here and the Northwest in particular, is widely recognized uh, with the company estimated to have invested over one billion in the local operation since the opening in 1993. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, Kermit, I've got to ask him, colleagues, my wife is slicing Frio, uh, the Frio Air Engine, as such a regular. Thanks very much uh, to the Deputy First Minister for his response. Um, I know he has dwelt somewhat there in the creative sectors and film industries, but could the, the Deputy First Minister give us any indication as to what particular economic or business sectors are likely to benefit from the visit to the United States this year? He did allude earlier to them. If he could give us some indication as to what those sectors might be. Well, I, I think that given that we engaged in a, a very important uh, lunch for 120 senior executives in Silicon Valley. Uh, people can draw their own conclusions as to what sort of sectors we have been pitching at. Uh, certainly we're very encouraged by the response that we received. And I think it's safe to say that the First Minister would agree with me that this was probably uh, the most successful uh, economic uh, business venture that we have been involved in, in terms of foreign trips. So, well worthwhile in our opinion, and uh, both the First Minister and I feel that we can stand here today confidently predicting that there will be some very, very good news from several fronts over the course of the coming weeks and months. I call George Robinson. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, could I ask the Deputy First Minister, can any of those investors be encouraged to locate in East Londonderry to help to alleviate some of the DVA job losses in Korean recently. 
Well, I have every sympathy with uh, the member, and indeed all members from uh, that constituency. Uh, there have been a number of uh, very serious job losses, uh, and even historically, the loss of Seagate in the Lamavari area was a very, very sore blow. Then we had the KPL announcement and, of course, the loss of the DVA jobs. Uh, those represent a very serious blow for the constituency. Uh, that's why we're placing such a, a major focus on the development of the Ballykelly site. And as the First Minister has clearly indicated in previous answers, uh, it's very encouraging what is shaping up for that particular location. Uh, and that's outside of the relocation of DARD to that site. We think that there is uh, much more uh, can be developed on that site and a tremendous amount of interest in that site at this time. And the whole purpose of that is obviously to provide employment uh, for the uh, Northwest uh, region. So I have every sympathy for uh, what the member has uh, said. Uh, and certainly we do everything in our power, and Invest in I is doing everything in its power to try and ensure that in situations where there have been heavy job losses, that we can compensate for that by encouraging uh, those who might be interested in investing here in the north to look at those areas. Dominic Bradley is not in his place. I call Declan McLear. Uh, to a hut for the whole question eight. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'd ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. I was delighted to accept the invitation from Aileen Campbell, MS, our Scottish Minister for Children and Young People, to attend the Four Nations Play Symposium in Glasgow on the 13th of March. The symposium takes place every two years, and the aim is to have a discussion about play policies and strategies that will benefit children and young people. When I was there, I told the audience about recent developments and future plans to enhance the opportunities for play and leisure across the North. We heard from uh, each region, and a theme that emerged was the play rarely has an obvious lead department. However, many departments, agencies, and the voluntary and community organisations provide for play in its own right and as a medium to address issues such as physical and mental health and social needs. This highlights the importance of a joint-up approach to providing for play, and we remain committed to leading a coordinated approach to play through the Play and Leisure Implementation Plan and enhancing provision through the Play and Leisure Signature Programme, to which we have committed to spend £1.6 million over the next three years. Play Board presented its community-based Can Play project, which it delivered in Carrick, Fergus, Antrim, Newton Abbey, with the support of Peace 3 funding. This project has inspired one strand of the signature program, which will build on the Play Board concept to help support communities to provide for play. I also visited a bus which is part of the Scottish Play Talk and Read campaign. The campaign promotes the critical importance of play in the earliest years of a childhood, or earliest years of a child's life, and provides many resources to parents and carers. We would like to build on existing initiatives here to ensure that everyone appreciates that play is a vital ingredient in the development of our children through to adulthood. The experience we, we shared at the symposium will help us to achieve more to increase the opportunities for children and young people to gain all the benefits of play and leisure. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, the last Concordia. Um, could the Minister give us an update on the, her visit to the Castle Milk Youth Complex while, while at the play symposium? Yes, um, when, when we were there in Glasgow, um, we, we took the opportunity to visit Castle Milk Youth Complex, and Castle Milk is, is a part of Glasgow, which um, is in a very high, uh, has families which, which would be considered families from disadvantaged, sort of economically and socially disadvantaged. So we were very, very, um, you know, uh, glad for them to, to allow us to come in and, and to see what happened. And really, it's a youth complex, and it's one, uh, as I said, in one of the largest housing estates in Glasgow. And it has a long track record of offering programmes uh, and projects of positive intervention and education to, as I said, some of the most poorest and disaffected young people in Glasgow. So it was a very, very good learning experience um, for us. And we hope that we can bring some of the experience that we learnt in the way the programmes are delivered in that complex back. I have to say, for me, one of the, one of the most um, enjoyable parts of the evening was seeing the way those young people all came together in this, this sort of a warehouse building. 
not just you know, for, for, for to, to, to meet with each other, but there was also children there who had um, different disabilities. And you know, to just to see them working together with those children in in the art, uh, the, the the form of art and uh, of play, was really really um, uh, a good experience for me. But it also it was about tackling sectarianism. It was about tackling the drug and alcohol misuse. So all those pro uh, all those issues that we have here as well uh, um, in the north, you know, there's definitely lessons in my view that could be learned um, from from the people in Castle Milk. And that is the end of the period of listed questions and we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Miss Anna Lowe. May I start? <laughs> Deputy Speaker. Um, I w given the uh, commitments uh, within the strategy together building a united community. Um, can, can I ask the minister how can his party justify not supporting the Alliance Party's amendment last week uh, on good relations to be included in community planning within uh, the, the uh, local government bill? Order, order. Deputy First Minister. Uh, with your permission, Deputy Speaker. Order members. Deputy First Minister. Uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. Uh, <coughs> just, just to answer your, first, or your last part of the question um, to the member, I would basically say that that, um, that actually ran contrary, we believe, to the quality um, issues that have already been um, identified in terms of Section 75, and we actually felt that it diluted um, uh, the, the equality agenda. But just to, to come back to you about together and um, building a united community, obviously we are, and I know that we have been involved in our department um, to actually be, you know, you know about, about um, the, the different th uh, themes that are there, and there will be a ministerial panel um, happening uh, either this week or next week just to discuss the way forward in that. There has already been pilots identified, particularly for young people, um, in terms of the United Youth Programme. There has been specific pilots. And I have to say, you know, when we go out, um, myself and Junior Minister Bale, um, to uh, dealing with uh, some of the events with young people, and I was at the event that the Deputy First Minister mentioned earlier yesterday, when we listen to young people and we see young people want, the, want to move forward um, uh, to, together, they want to, to, to move forward um, in equality, and they, they, want to, they want to actually you know, say, tell, tell, tell us in, in places like this, you know, it's their future um, that's important, and, and we need to be listened to, to what those young people are saying. I call Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank the junior minister for her response. And of course, it is very important. We listen to young people and work with them. They are our future. But, can I ask the junior minister how, how are you, how, how is the minister going to ensure that the new local councils are going to live up to delivering good uh, community relations well, program? Well, I mean, I, I think that, that all um, uh, councils, whether or all government, whether it's at a local level in, in the council or whether it's at central government level up here, I think that everybody should be committed for to delivering um, equality for everyone. I don't think that, that any, any that in my opinion, you know, what we, what we can't afford to do is dilute any sort of uh, equality gains that we have made because uh, no one should be frightened. No one should be frightened about um, equality for everyone. And I think that, that you know, any, any, any right-thinking person has to see that you, know, that, that you need to actually build on, on legislation and you need to actually build on what's already there to actually strengthen the equality agenda because equality is, is, is a basic human right for everybody. So, I mean, everybody, no matter, no matter what their background, um, uh, should enjoy the same access of opportunity to all services that are there, whether it's by local council or central government or whatever, and also everyone, no matter what their economic, social, political background is, they all should, should have that same, same, those same rights. 
I call Cahill Boylan. Carmagat, uh, last can call you. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister what prospect of success does he expect from the party leaders in meetings dealing with flags and emblems, parades and the past? Carmel Margaret. Well, uh, Deputy Speaker, I, I'm the eternal optimist and I work forward on the basis that if people are prepared to commit to serious engagement around these important issues, that it is possible to find a way forward. I think the way forward has been pointed out to all of us as a result of the great work done by uh, Richard Haas and uh, Megan O'Sullivan. Uh, and I think it's critically important that we all understand that we have a duty and a responsibility as leaders to lead. And uh, lead leading can be a lonely post, but it can only be done from the front. And that means effectively standing up to those who would uh, be determined, as some are, both within my own community and in the community of the representatives uh, opposite, who are determined to drag us back uh, there. Under no circumstances am I going to stand by and allow that happen. And I think the fact that the other parties are prepared to continue with the party leaders' meetings, uh, against the backdrop of recognising that the eyes of the world are on us, and we saw that in the United States with a very powerful speech made by Vice President uh, Joe Biden at the American Ireland Fund Dinner, and the, the remarks made also by President Obama at the Speaker's lunch. Uh, there is a huge focus on what we are doing here, and I think that it's critically important that we engage very seriously in those discussions. I'm engaging them in good faith, and on the basis that the others who will attend those meetings are as serious about finding a, a resolution as I am. I call Cahill Boylan. Cora Margaret, uh, last time I called you, I was going to wake less than I was up to Rangra. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his reply, but in light of what the Deputy First Minister said and in light of the upcoming elections, does he believe that some parties are more interested in bandstanding rather than dealing with these serious issues? Cora Margaret. Well, I, 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 certainly, I certainly do believe that, that there are inter interest groups and politicians who attempt to use these situations for their own purposes. Uh, and that's why I have to express my particular disappointment at the behaviour of the Ulster Unionist Party, whose contribution to the Haas stuff clearly would suggest that they are certainly one of those parties that are grandstanding and uh, adopting a, a position which they believe will get them preference votes in the upcoming European and local government elections. I do think that those people who are out there within the uh, loyalist community, those people who have shown themselves to be extremists over the course of recent times, uh, are not representative of where the vast majority of unionists and loyalists are coming from. People don't want anything to do with sectarianism, don't want anything to do with racism, and certainly from our perspective within my community, want absolutely nothing to do with so-called dissident groups who think that it's a good idea to go out and bomb people and shoot people. So, and we've seen examples in this House today of how uh, efforts are made to bully people. Uh, and I consider the comments made by the member for North Antrim uh, against uh, uh, the member for South Belfast, Anna Lowe, as a continuation of the bullying that happened, for example, whenever people in East Belfast were criticised, when people in East Belfast were criticised because they were, when people in East Belfast were criticised because they were learning the Irish language. Deputy First Minister. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that any process in dealing with the past must keep open the prospect of victims getting justice? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And uh, in the course of the Haas uh, discussions, Haas came forward with very serious proposals. Going into those talks, my party, and of course I'm not here to answer for Sinn Féin, I'm here speaking on behalf of OFM, DFM, but my party uh, was prepared to compromise, given that we had our own position on the three issues, and the compromise did involve the establishment of uh, an historical investigation unit, very serious uh, project, which is about delivering justice for citizens, uh, alongside the independent information 
uh, recovery uh, mechanism and, of course, uh, the establishment of an adjudicating body in terms of how parades will be dealt with. But uh, the particular comment is specifically about the past and whether or not people are entitled to justice, uh, and I absolutely agree. I call Michelle McElveen. And further to that, would the Deputy First Minister agree that the police and prosecuting authorities should pursue those who have committed criminal offences, irrespective of whether or not they are so-called friends of the peace process? Well, I think that that does raise a very serious question about whether or not uh, efforts are being made to pursue people who were involved in uh, activities in the past, uh, involving members of the British Army, involving members of the RUC, involving members of the UDR. And there is a very clear perception. There is a very clear perception. There is a very clear. Well, order. Members can try and interrupt all they want because the truth obviously hurts. But the, the reality, the reality is that I am not going to be bullied and I am not going to be cowed by any of the chirping from the sidelines. The, the reality that we are dealing with is that if there is going to be justice, it has to be justice for all. I call Cahill Uhashin. Uh, uh, um, given the uh, Deputy First Minister and the First Minister's recent visit to Silicon Valley, uh, could I ask him for his assessment, please? of the uh, possibilities of job opportunities emanating from that quarter? Well, as I said in my earlier answer, both the First Minister and I are, are very confident that uh, very substantial uh, job announcements will take place uh, over the course of uh, the coming weeks and months. Uh, this was one of the most encouraging uh, economic missions that we have been on, and it was clear from the turnout at the Silicon Valley event that there is tremendous interest in what is happening here in the north of Ireland. People absolutely get it whenever world brand companies like the uh, Chicago Mercantile, the New York Stock Exchange, Allstate and indeed many others uh, base their enterprises here and further develop them, uh, increasing our employment prospects but also uh, increasing uh, revenue, revenues for their own companies. So I think that you know, it's, it's hugely encouraging whenever we go there to see people who are taking a very clear interest in the propositions that we have to offer. What is also very encouraging are the number of people who are actually out in Silicon Valley who have connections to the island of Ireland, who themselves uh, found it uh, beneficial to turn up at that event and to outline for us the different projects that they're involved in throughout the island of Ireland, including in the north of Ireland. So I think, yes, that the, the very positive reception that we received will certainly lead to very positive announcements very, very shortly. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer there. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that the devolution of the maximum amount of fiscal powers here is indeed uh, desirable and indeed uh, the devolution of corporation tax will assist in bringing job opportunities to here? Well, it, it won't come as any secret to anybody in this house that both the First Minister and I and uh, the Executive in its entirety absolutely believe that it's crucial to get the uh, devolution of, uh, of these powers for our administration. Uh, and obviously we're impatient to do that and we're very conscious that uh, it has been made clear that there will be no decision on this until after the Scottish uh, referendum uh, later this year. But it certainly is our assessment that even in the context of the position as it stands at the minute, we're doing a very, very good job in attracting foreign direct investment because we have attracted more foreign direct investment in the course of the last couple of years than at any other time in the history of the state. And to do that against the backdrop of a, uh, an economic recession, which has been very cruel uh, worldwide, I would contend is a major achievement. So just think what we can do if we can get the uh, uh, powers to reduce our corporation tax to the sort of level that exists in Dublin. It would make a huge difference and I think would clearly bring uh, tens of thousands of new jobs. I call Jerry Kelly. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister, is he aware of a legal opinion given to both uh, Nicky and uh, the Equality Commission uh, by Robert Allen and Dean Masters regarding age uh, discrimination with uh, goods facilities? and services legislation? 
Uh, with your permission, Deputy Speaker, I'll ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. Yes, um, can I say to the member I do share many of the concerns which the legal opinion offers in respect of this legislation, in particular with regards to the exclusion um, of, people on, uh, of persons under 18, um, generally from the protection of age discrimination in goods, facilities and services. And I think that also um, when we look at the, the drafters of the legal opinion have also said that there, there will be likely um, be justification for allowing some special measures to protect the interests um, of vulnerable age groups. And we see that already in the, like, of the immunisation programme for, for children and also um, the, the free travel bus pass for, for older people. But I think it's very, very important that, that, you know, that, that we look at um, some of the issues that, that was actually raised. Um, by Robert Allen QC and D Masters when they actually brought this um, opinion forward. And that concludes question time for today.